we've got a shank here. Now, what, what, what the shank is going to give into, and we'll draw it here, is the bend. Now, the, there can be different shapes of bend. The thing to understand, there's two parts of the hook here that's important. There's the shape of the bend, and there's what we call the gape. If I draw a standard round bend here, just to show you, the gape is the gap between the shank and the upturn point of the hook there. So this, this, this here is the gape. From here to here, all of this is the gape. Now what's important to get right with the gape is the gape has to match the bait you're using. So if you're going to use quite a, quite a big chunky bait, like say a maggot or two maggots, you want to have a reasonably wide gape so as the maggot sits completely in the gape. The trouble with using a narrow gape, and I'll draw one here, the maggot, is your maggot is actually going to extend slightly beyond the gape of the hook. This is bad for a couple of reasons. One, when a fish sucks the bait in, you want to make sure that the hook point, as it gets sucked in, is clean. That, that you know, the fish can be hooked cleanly. If the maggot's masking the hook point when it sucks in, there's a chance that the fish can spit out again and you haven't hooked it. The other problem with not having a bait like a maggot securely in a wide gape is that here there's a potential for the maggot to curl up and cover the point of the hook because it isn't sitting completely rested in this and double maggots are even worse you can imagine two maggots or a worm or a big bait needs this wider gape and again most modern hooks tend to have a fairly wide gape it's only the delicate um, winter hooks for say a blood worm that's got th this narrower gape with a blood worm you can see why the narrow gape is going to work if I talk about the reverse situation so if I drop my narrow gape again and I've got a blood worm coming off here which is quite a thin bit, or a single pinky. There's my bedroom. Obviously, the narrow gate is kind of is kind of the right dimensions for the bedroom. If I put a very small bedroom here, I'd have far too much hook showing above it. And when a fish sucks in, it's going to feel the resistance of the wire before it feels the bait. So you need to kind of balance up the gape to the size of bait you're using. But for anything bigger than a pinky or a bloodworm, you're looking at, these days, a fairly wide gape as being the best choice. The other point about here is the shape of the bend. There are various shapes and into all sorts of dimensions, but basically you've got the round bend, which would just be, as the name suggests, round, and you've got the more sort of stepped type hooks, which might come down like this, depending on the pattern. And I'll show you two hooks that show the difference here. Here's a, a Milo hook that's got the more stepped form. I don't know if you can pick that out, but you might see the form of the hook. It's got a slightly more stepped form. And here's the back again to a classic round bend, which is very, which is perfectly circular. The bend just holds a bit. Now, this sort of set thing, th this is good when you're fishing with something like a pellet, because it can hold the pellet, imagine your pellet like that, very securely in that little step there, like that. There's your, there's your expander pellet on the hook, like that. But generally speaking, I think if you're starting to think about baits and hooks, look at the gate first. Make sure that if you're going to fish with a reasonably bulky bait, like a grain of corn or um, maggot or double maggot, so a head of a worm, that you've got a fairly wide gape that the bait can sit comfortably in it and it's in proportions. When the fish sucks it in, the point's clear and it's all in proportion. Narrow gape hooks are great for small baits and delicate fishing, but that's about as far as I go with these narrow gape hooks. So there we are. Eyes, shank, gape, bends. Everyone with it so far? What we're trying to do is simplify the hook down to its various bits. Now, the, the next bit I'm going to talk about is the point, and with it comes the notion of barbed and barbless. Now, a lot of this is going to be decided by a uh, uh, fishery rules, in that many venues in the UK, certainly, barbless hooks are all you're allowed to use. But uh, barbed hooks or micro-barbed hooks are a possibility. So, let's start, first of all, with the micro-barbed versus the barbless. Now, on a barbless hook, the wire is just sharpened to a point and chemically etched, and it comes straight down to the bend and up to form the hook. That would be a barbless hook. There's no barb on it. On a micro-barbed hook, when the wire is hot, a small part or small notch is made here in the wire to tease or pull some of the wire out, creating what we call a, a micro-barb. It looks a little bit like this. So it would create a step here in the hook. So I'll draw the hook around like that. 
So your barbless hook is a straightforward needle. The hook sharpens a needle point and the wire continues straight. And on the, the micro barb hook, part of the wire as it's hot and molten is teased out to create a step. Now, the micro barb helps if you're trying to fish um, a bait like uh, like maggots or worms because it holds the bait on the hook. The, the bait can't slide up the hook. And what many people believe is when you hook a fish, the micro barb stops the hook falling out of the fish. Now, there's been lots of work done on this, lots of arguments about this. And essentially, I suppose, provided you're using the right elastic and provided you're keeping pressure on the fish, there's no reason to ever lose a fish with a barbless hook. There's also some evidence that barbless hooks cause less damage to the bait. So if you're fishing with a delicate bait, like bloodworm, a barbless hook will, 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 will cause it less damage. But if you're fishing, uh, if you're fishing for roach, say, on a big lake on the feeder a long way out, there is some security in using a micro barb hook because it gives you, when you strike, strike the hook, it gives you a little bit of, of security that the fish is still on. However, today in modern fishing, I think the barbless hook has become, if you wish, the standard. And certainly for big fish, for anything away from, from small fish fishing, barbless hooks are, are every bit as good, and provided you play fish carefully and don't let the pole or line go slack, there's no reason at all for losing them with a barbless hook compared to a micro barb. In terms of points, there are different points and hooks. Some points and hooks can be slightly curved in like that, so you get the point slightly curved in. And again, the idea is that you hook a fish, if the point's curved in, it, it'll hold the fish more securely. But generally, what's more important is the sharpness. Uh, uh, there's a lot of hooks you buy that'll blunt up to two or three fish. Now, that's what you don't want. From a hook, what's important, more than anything else in the point, is the way the point's finished, and that the point stays sharp after baiting and so on. You can always test this. With a barbless hook, you can always try and just, just get, get, get a bit of your trousers or some cotton, and make sure you can push the in and out, that it goes in cleanly. With micro barbed hooks, test it even against your finger, just check that the point still feels sharp, and the minute it feels blunt, change the hook. Um, Hooks used to be notorious for going blunt, but something called a chemical etching or, or, or chemically processing happened where when the hook's being made no nowadays, you can put, when hook's being made, th there tends to be a lot of rough edges or burring on the wire as it gets bent round and sharpened to this point. And what chemical etching does is it, it, it uses chemicals to clean the point to a very smooth finish. And this makes the point much sharper. So we've got the hook building up now to its point, which of course is very important. I've got one last bit to cover in our little anatomy of hooks. Well, I've finished with my artwork, and I want to talk about one last aspect of hook, sele hook selection, and it's this. It's the, the gauge of wire, or the thickness of the wire, and by association, the weight of the hook. Now, this is a bit of common sense involved in this. If you're going to target big carp, uh, on the pole, let's say, or on anything, there is no point in fishing with a very fine wire hoop because that fine wire will be uh, easily bent by a big fish and will, the hoop will simply straighten and you lose fish. So to some extent, you start by thinking of the fish you're trying to target and you start thinking about the gauge of the wire. So what you've got to think about is, is the hook strong enough to get safely to the bank the fish you're hoping to catch? The next thing you've got to think about is the weight of the hook. And this is where the compromise comes in because, of course, if we fished everywhere with great big heavy hooks, we get every fish we caught in, but we might not get any bites. Because the weight of the hook affects the way the fish pick the hook up. So the lighter the wire you can use, the, the easier it'll be for a fish when it's sucking a bit in to, to take the hook. It'll feel less resistance, less inertia. Now remember, fish are swimming along, uh, maybe off the bottom, they're coming down, they're picking up bits of food, and they're, they're blowing in and rejecting anything that feels a bit odd. So if you're picking up maggots, and then suddenly you take up, pick up a maggot that feels unusually heavy because it's got a great big hook in it, a heavy hook in it, the fish will reject it, and that bait will be left untaken. So the balancing act is picking a hook that's light enough to get your bites, and thick enough in the wire to get the fish in. Now, sometimes it's easy. If you're going to fish for big carp, you're going to be using a reasonably big bait, so you're going to want something like that with a fair bit of, of wire in the hook. It's a strong hook. Okay. Where it gets more difficult is when you're trying to target... Um, you're trying to target all sorts of fish. You're trying to get bites from different fish, and you don't quite know... Uh, you don't quite know what's going to, you're going to catch next. And you're going to want a hook that's got some strength in the wire. And here's a good example. It's a Drennan Silverfish Match. 
It's a relatively fine wire hook, but it's a strong hook, relatively. So if you do catch a big fish with this hook, you've got a good chance of getting it in. And I say to you, it's all about trying to think the compromise through. Now, here's a hook that, will, that you'd be very lucky to get any carp in. It's a Drennan Fine Match. And this has got a very fine wire. It's a very delicate hook. It's a very light hook. But for presentation, that's better than the other hooks I've shown you. So it's all about trying to think through its logic, if you wish. Am I going for carp? If I'm going for carp, leave all the fine wire, the light wire hooks alone. Go to a shop, pick a good, strong wire, possibly forged hook, something with plenty of strength in it. If you're trying to catch a variety of hooks, try to pick a wire and a way to hook that's, that's a balance, that's in between, not too fine, gives you a chance of getting the hooks out, the fish out, but strong enough, <coughs> strong enough to get most fish on the bank, but light enough for fish to pick it up easily. And if you know it's going to be hard, if you're looking for small fish, etc., go for a very fine wire, a very light hook, because the inertia as the fish sucks the bait in will be less. Okay? Now, that's my anatomy of hook little tour finished. Now I'd like to go back to the tackle shop and we'll try and talk through how you can actually put this into practice when you're faced with that wall of hooks and that, cho that choice of hooks. What do you look for? What are you picking? Given the bait you're going to use, the fish you're going to target, the time of year possibly, you know, the colour of the water. The water's very clear. Maybe you want to go slightly lighter on the wire, slightly smaller on the hook size. Uh, I make a decision based on these factors. Now you've got your hook built up here. One thing to think about is the way hook sizing works and hook sizes. In angling, uh, hook numbers for coarse fishing go in a strange uh, logic. The smaller the hook, the bigger the number. So a size 22 hook is considerably smaller than a size 6. The key to numbers is you trying to match the size of your hook up to the bait you're going to use. There is no point in putting a whole lobworm on a size 18 hook because the, the bait's huge and the hook itself will be lost at the top. So when a fish takes the bait in, the hook itself is too small to neatly uh, get the point into the fish's mouth. So as a guide, again, think about the, the, the size of bait you're using. It's a bit like thinking about the gape and the size of hook you need. So, for example, for two grains of sweet corn, a size 14 hook would be totally acceptable, but for a single pinky, a size 14 hook would be far too big. So w when you're faced with, with, with a choice, think about, have an idea of the baits you're going to use. So as a guide, a size 20, 22 for single maggot, 18, 20 for double maggot, 18, 20 for a small head of worm, 16, 18 for a bigger bit of worm, 16 for a, a, a four mil expander pellet, 14 for a six mil expander pellet, bit of meat, that sort of thinking. Try to think of the baits you're going to use and the size of hook you need to accommodate that bait so as the bait sits securely on the hook and the point is just showing beyond the baits. When the fish sucks it in, that point can hook the fish cleanly.